Welcome to the online breakout session, Ask the Founder. My name is Lisa McDaniel, and I'm the advocacy coordinator for the Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation. The Guthy, the Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation is proud to be a source of information about NMO. Our comments are based on advice, published experience, and expert opinion, but we do not represent therapeutic recommendation, dietary recommendation, or prescription recommendation. For specific information and advice, please consult your personal physician. I am very excited today to introduce our special guest. She is a mother, a wife, a philanthropist, an author. She's a friend, a Hollywood makeup artist turned cosmetics entrepreneur, infomercial media pioneer, and founder of the Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation. Miss Victoria Jackson, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. It's so nice to see everybody. I wish I could see every single face. And uh, right now I'm just a gal at home like everybody else, you know, I'm hoping everybody's really healthy and, and navigating these extraordinarily crazy times that we're in. So it's really nice that I get to connect with everybody and super sorry I didn't get to see everybody um, at the conference earlier, but it was such a, um, a crazy time and a hard time to figure out the best decision to make, but um, wanted everybody to be healthy and stay healthy first and foremost. So, so hello and hello, Lisa. So I'm here to answer any questions and kind of just update you and whatever I can do to just know that I'm thinking about everybody. Thank you, Victoria. We've certainly had a lot of emails come in with a lot of questions for you. And I'm, I'm very excited to dig into some of those, but first, we all realize that you have a very busy life and you've certainly lived a full life with all the many titles that we just read off about you and you continue to carry them daily. Could you just take a few minutes and just kind of update us a little bit? The biggest questions I, I get from patients is how you and your family are doing. Well, fortunately, you know, we're doing good. Everybody's been okay. I'll talk about Allie in a second. I did have my older son who lives in Portland did come down with a COVID-19 and he's recovering. He's okay. But that was, you know, as a mom, I know all of you out there just know how hard it is. And as a, as a parent, you know, when your child is, is not well and, um, but he's doing okay. And, and we're grateful for that. And I'd say probably, honestly, Lisa, the most challenging times have been right now in that you all know that Allie went through a long stretch of having no flares, no episodes, no attacks. I know everybody has a different word, a relapse. I just am like, but she did have two of them and that was really hard. She's doing okay. Um, but, you know, we were, had been in, an, uh, in a nice long stretch that I know some of you may get, some of you may not, but we had that and um, that, was, that was really hard. So we've been navigating that. I just want to reassure everybody um, without having to go too deep into all of, you know, Allie's um, trials, uh, because that's really for her to talk about. Um, when I first started talking about it, she was 14 and now she's going to be um, 27 next week. So uh, I think it's about time I have to let her do a little more talking for herself. <laughs> but um, wow. Uh -huh. we've, all kind of, we've all kind of watched her grow up over the years, I think, uh, from the beginning of this. Yeah. Well, and too, you know, well, you know, Lisa, as a, as a mom, it's, it doesn't matter how old they get, right? We're all still always um, worrying about them and, and just, you know, so what we, we navigated, it was very tricky as I'm sure I, I know I'm speaking to everybody who, who knows what it's like and, and goes through and having to, you know, deal with trying to go to the hospital during a pandemic uh, and, and navigating all that was, was definitely challenging, but uh, we're coming out the other side of it and, and she's, she's doing really good. So, so that's the update on that. Um, as far as I've been full, just working away, actually, It'll be interesting for you to know. Let's see, what was I doing even up until last night? I've been working on an, on an op-ed piece uh, with uh, Miss Gloria Steinem for uh, potentially coming out in the New York Times. We'll see if they pick it up. But uh, it's a piece that's really about how using this blueprint of what uh, 
Dr. Michael Yaman and myself and the team and everybody's been doing to help, um, you know, really work on what's now been four international clinical trials that we've had in the last four years, actually resulting in some therapies that are uh, hopefully going to be coming out soon. I know one already is and hopefully more to come. Um, but using that as a blueprint for potentially um, a vaccine for COVID. So just, you know, uh, Michael and I have always felt strongly if there's anything that we're doing or have done that can be helpful to whether it's other autoimmune diseases or things that are going on in the world, um, which I never started out thinking about having an impact on, but if, if we can do that now, we're doing that. So that, that's exciting and you know, we'll keep you updated if, if the piece gets picked up, we'll make sure to send it to everybody. I'm sure everyone listening would be very interested to, to read that. And so we're hoping to read it soon. Yeah, I am too. Um, then on some fun things, um, I have been working on, this is a complete U-turn uh, for me, but almost kind of getting back to what my roots were a little bit. But man, do I have roots now? Ha ha, don't we all? Um, <laughs> um, but getting back to the in the beauty industry, uh, with I'm working with, I think a lot of you've known uh, Ellen DeGeneres has been a, a very, very dear friend of mine for a long time. And I created a skincare line for her. So I'll make sure you all know about the skincare line <laughs> when it's coming out. But uh, kind of in my, uh, my moment of getting back into a lab, a different kind of lab, uh, I've been making a, a line of cosmetics that will be called All Kind uh, uh, by Ellen DeGeneres. So it's All Kind by Ellen. That'll be launching in Sephora. It's completely different than what I've been doing, but what I used to do, but has, uh, has given me a moment to sort of revisit that from 12 years ago. So that's been really fun. And so uh, what it'll also be as it relates to the work I'm doing and, and the foundation is give me a chance to, you know, probably get out there more. She and I just shot some videos and content um, all around the skincare line. So I think that'll also help give me another platform to talk about, you know, the work, you know, Victoria, what have you been doing in the last 12 years and, and talk about NMO uh, and the successes that we've had. That sounds very exciting. Yeah, I'm excited personally to um, to know that you've got a little bit of hand in a makeup line again. Um, I loved your makeup before, so it's exciting to hear. And I know many of our patients love your makeup. So, yep. well, we'll start with skincare, go on to some color cosmetics. But I think, yeah, this is just fun. So I was glad that I was able to do that to keep myself um, a little preoccupied during all these uh, crazy times and also with all the alley stuff going on and if you're lucky enough to have a friend like that who can uh, probably keep you laughing a little bit, it's a, it's a good thing. So yeah, and I, I hope too um, that everybody is taking that time, whatever they need for themselves to really, you know, just move as you can, you know, distract yourself, you think about how you can, you know, what you can add and do in the world, you know, that's what I'm always doing, whether I'm on my computer or just, you know, I, this is a really challenging time and a time we're all reevaluating. And I know that you had um, Cameron on who has helped with me with some meditation and, you know, thinking about diet and all those things that necessarily we don't always take, you know, the caregivers that are out there that are on the line right now that, you know, do a, a better job of maybe taking care of others than we do of taking care of ourselves. Yes, that's a good point. And talking with caregivers a lot, I hear them, I hear the burnout in their voice sometimes and, and know that they're not taking adequate care of themselves. So it's good to hear you kind of reiterate that for them. Yeah. So I want to ask some, do you have some questions that I can answer? And because I want to make sure, you know me, when I'm always standing up there at the podium, um, I just always want to make sure that I'm helping address what's on people's minds and what they're thinking about and um, and reassure them that I haven't gone off and just made, you know, moisturizer and forgotten about <laughs> NMO. That's not going to happen. So um, I, I do know. have. I do have questions uh, for you. Um, 
actually, let's go along the lines of what you were just talking about um, with reflection time during this pandemic. Uh, what is something that you have learned about yourself during this time of physical distancing and reflection? Hmm. Well, because I'm like a hugger person, I have to learn, you know, to do things more like no mistake. You know? Like, so the distance has been interesting for me. Um, I'm, you know, part of my own personal therapy has been, you know, kind of window shopping or doing things where I'm distract myself a lot. And so I find the challenge for me is just having to, you know, get sort of go a little more inward and, and be more reflective. And I, I think that's good. I think I'll come out of this figuring out how to more, you know, be strategic with my time, give myself a little time off. Um, so yeah, I think thinking about family, not being able, I really miss not being able to just be with my, um, my other kids as well as Allie and grandkids. So kind of what we're all going through, but knowing that um, I think in a lot of ways, NMO and, and what, you know, we've all been dealing with for so long, um, really helped prepare me as well for COVID-19, because I think we've all been right in this kind of heightened place and this concern and anxiety that can wash over us. And sometimes those episodes can last longer than others. Uh, it's, it's almost sort of like I felt like, oh, I've, I've been in this place. I know, I know COVID-19 is just, you know, another sort of moment, a different moment, but, you know, NMO. So I, I guess it, in that sense, I, I can't say that I'm happy about it, but it felt like I was somewhat had been through um, kind of the bomb going off before. So maybe some of you feel that. I think that's very understandable. And I think all of us uh, in the NMO mm -hmm. world have probably felt that way of one at one time or another. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you, can you talk to us about um, any changes that have been made in your personal life or career over the last few months? Um, are there any changes that you plan to keep or maintain once life begins to resume to some kind, some kind of normalcy? Well, I want to really, as far as, you know, uh, get back to figuring out in the foundation where we can have our kind of hands-on connections again, um, what, you know, what will that look like? So it's really thinking through what will conferences look like? What will, you know, meeting people uh, internationally that always, you know, I think a big part of our success was getting people together and crossing borders and, you know, getting on those planes and things that now we'll sort of have to think about how will people be doing that? So um, that, you know, I want to sort of huddle up with the group and, and figure out how we can both most effectively. Um, Michael and I have had meetings, whether we're going to Verily um, or meeting with Genentech or meeting with people that have new ideas, new researchers, um, uh, scientists, so patients. So I think it's evolving to figure out what this new world will look like in terms of it. But my, I always want to reassure people that my commitment uh, is steadfast through NMO and through uh, COVID-19. Thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions. I know you mentioned Allie. Um, there's a couple of other questions about hers, if you if, about her, if you don't mind answering them. Um, you've already told us how she's doing. Um, there's some questions about her treatment, and is she still able to have her treatments during this time? Yeah, she she has, and certainly, as you all know, when you have an attack, you still have to have that, um, you know, the the steroid, the, the the pulses and things. So she's been able to do that, um, you know, and. We're fortunate for that, but we, you know, I wish I could say there's still the, the magic pill that I have for Allie, but there isn't the magic pill. Um, when we, we're all working to find that, what that will be and what will be shared with everybody in, in real time. So um, I think that's, you know, I think that's just been probably the hardest part for everybody there is, you know, just, but we've made so much progress and that at least has been very, uh, very comforting to know that we've made that progress and she's just working away. I mean, listen, she's still doing at home now. I'm sure a lot of you, uh, people that are in school, she's doing her school uh, at home. 
at UCLA. Uh, she's doing business and law and she's doing it online. And then she's doing like, maybe a lot of you also doing a lot of baking and baking banana bread and things. And so, so we're, we're getting through it. We're, we're very fortunate. We, we never forget how, uh, how fortunate and blessed we are. Oh, great. Speaking of food and banana bread and baking, um, mm -hmm. there's a question um, asking, is there anything you or Allie have found to be helpful in diet and nutrition wise for NMO? You know, it's so funny because Allie, since she's been 14, doesn't really like me to, you know, manage her diet, get in the way of, you know, I'm still mom and she wants to eat what she eats. And, um, you know, I've always felt, I mean, I, I think you've all heard me ultimately, you've got to do what works for you, what works with your, you know, your doctor, your, your own, if that's such a, your own path kind of thing. But I really do think that when you're uh, eating with foods that are less inflammatory or, you know, obviously just being conscious of taking care of your body as, as best you can and helping it be prepared to fight, you know, what, what we're all feeling and taking on. So I'm just, I am more conscious that way and think about that. Um, and I always try to just put information out, whether it's you're going vegan or gluten-free, or you're just eating in moderation and uh, balanced meals. Um, you know, I try to put that same energy out and information to Allie and let her kind of find her own way with it, which as you know, is, is always the best thing. We all have to figure it out for ourselves. Of course. As a parent of a daughter with NMO, how does COVID-19 make you feel? Does it make you have more anxiety or worry for Allie? Um, you know what, I, I have the same worry for Allie as I do for my other, you know, I have three kids and for my grandkids. And when my son in Portland had it, he was, um, you know, he, they have a very small house and he was in the basement and they've got, you know, he has a wife and two kids upstairs. And so, of course, I was more, you know, worried like everybody else. But um, I, I think I just put it in that, again, it, it's, it's honestly interesting, Lisa. I don't know if it's because of having had this, as I say, the, the bomb that went off that turned all of our lives upside down, right? With NMO, that uh, when COVID came in, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, I I can we we can navigate this. We'll we'll figure it out. So um, that's not to say like you know you. I think we all feel like you go in waves. I do anyway, where you're just certain days are better than others, or you just find yourself, um, you know, just having a lot of inner dialogue and just keep moving forward. I'm both Allie and I, when we wrote the book, Saving Each Other, like we're both survivors and she's even more of a thriver. I'm a thriver, but more survivor, <laughs> but she's just a thriver. You know, she's like, whatever's going on, she's going to just, you know, keep moving forward. So I, I think that's just but of course, I have the same anxieties as everybody. But I also want to think if there's anything as I'm watching it play out, what is it that I personally and the foundation we've learned that could be helpful to um, researchers, scientists, the world, advice, anything to help us, you know, find that next place that ultimately will give us peace uh, and the ability to, to sort of go back to our lives. I do think we're all searching for that and waiting for that time that we can go back to our lives. But thank you for that insight. Sure. What advice do you have for parents struggling to cope with their child's diagnosis of NMO? I, so I can completely relate. I, you know, up until even though 12 years later, I can't tell you I felt any less stress than, you know, day one, knowing all that I know. It's so it's a, it's a physical reaction, it's scary. But I like to think that, you know, when uh, we first started, you know, you would Google Devix disease or NMO, or I couldn't even find another patient that uh, was out there. Um, and there was no information. So it, it really is when they say knowledge is power, it is knowledge is, it can be, it's comfort. It's, um, it's something that you can, learn there's so many things you can read about educate yourself advocate for yourself for your child i mean you just you have to do that there's no other option and as michael's been doing these calls what's so great is he can always you know in real time tell you 
what is going on in the world of animal? What are potential? How close are we to some of these new therapies coming out? And I'm hoping we'll have some announcements soon. Um, and that is to me what you, you hold on to. And then you just, you know, give your child all the love and the support. And if you don't feel you're with the right team of people or docs, you just, you listen to your gut and your intuitive parenting voices in there that will guide you along the way because it's it's a journey. And I do remember speaking to a gentleman, his name, uh, Sandy, uh, who was uh, working with the Transverse Myelitis Association. And when she, Ellie was first diagnosed and I, I just really, you know, was, I, I, they, you know, in that case, they had told us we had four years and she would be gone. So I just wasn't even, didn't even know how to kind of breathe. And I lost sleep for a very, very long time. Um, but said, Victoria, this is, you're going to find yourself in a different place in 10 years from now. Like this will, there will be a new kind of normal, like a lot of what we hear in COVID, right? This whole new sort of normal. So I think that you will find your way in it. And uh, I, I don't mean that to be trite or Pollyanna-ish in any way, because I, I do know what you're feeling and experiencing. And it, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing harder. Um, so I, I, I get it, but I think them knowing that you're there, um, Lisa, to help guide them and direct them toward the right resources. We have so many resources right now. If you just look at the films, you get the app, get the app that we have. I know you all know about the app. Um, you're just gonna find there's, there's so much information that is out there that, and you might find some new things that you can share with us. Um, that's the, that's the kind of things you have to do. Um, you know, it's okay to kind of lay down on the floor for a while and just get all out what you need to, but then you got to get up and, you know, just educate yourself and, and become, become part of, of the process and, and help us in any way you feel you can. Yes, definitely. Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. that's one thing I learned from you along the way was knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was it hard for you during Allie's transition of care from you making decisions for her as a child to her making her own medical decisions as an adult? And do you have any tips for those of us facing that transition soon? Oh, I know that was so, that's, that was so hard. I just remember, and it sort of hit me all because I really hadn't been thinking about that. And then it was sort of one day her doctor said, we well, you know Allie's 18 now and it's really I need to talk just talk to Allie and I was like what no you just like talk to me um and no it was like Allie's like no mom I'm gonna I want to make my own decisions I want to hear what they say and um I think in our case Allie for a long time didn't want to really know about it or deal with it or was like oh, I know you mom you've got this figured out or you will figure it out so I think it was important for her to now sort of take the reins of it herself and she's maturing as a woman and so now you know it, it's gone pretty much the other way and I'll have to go so like what have you been talking about or have your doctor said anything or anything I should know or she'll be like I'll let you know when you need to know <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know so uh, it's kind of tough but you know what it's as a parent it's but it's a good thing because ultimately it means they're look at it's I don't need to be the one telling you. I mean, Allie always jokes, it goes, you know, you have men a moat more than I do. Um, that's been her way of dealing with it. But the reality is I don't, you all have NMO and uh, you have to navigate that the way you need to navigate that for yourself. And as a parent, you do that for your child to a certain point and then they need to do it as heartbreaking as it is for us that they even have this um, and for all of you that, you have to navigate it. You've got to make those decisions for yourself because, uh, and, and they're tough. There's a lot of things that you have to decide. It just, you know, they all kind of, uh, maybe the options suck a little bit and you're sort of like, I don't know what I want to do, but you have to, you've got to, as I've been doing in this process, learn to, um, you know, feel it in your gut your intuitive sense and then educate yourself. And 
but it's a good thing when they start owning it. And uh, trust me, they, they want to take care of their bodies ultimately. At least that's what, that's what we hope for. Yes, definitely. It, it, as hard as it is to watch your children grow up, I'm sure um, watching yeah. your child grow up with a rare disease and then take ownership of that has to be a little more difficult than uh, a normal childhood of growing up and turning into an adult. So right. thank you for sharing that. Sure. Let's switch gears a little bit. There's a lot of kind of fun questions that uh, people wrote in kind of wanting to get to know you a little better. One is, um, what is something that we, the NMOSD community, would be surprised to know about you? Do you have hidden talents or unusual interests, etc.? Hmm. Well, well, I don't really have a lot of hidden talents, as my kids remind me when they see me trying to ride like a bicycle or <laughs> try to go skiing or do something. Um, so, you know, I think people might think because they see me at the conference, you know, that I'm more outgoing or out there. Um, and I'm not, I'm actually quieter. And I've certainly found that out probably even more during these times. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm a more reflective person. I'm a, I'm a quiet person. I can deal a lot with my own sort of, especially um, going into this with Allie. Uh, I always suffered from more depression and anxiety. So I think um, that's always been, you know, and then you find like, you're always sort of thinking the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And then you get something like this to happen and you're like, oh my gosh, I think the sky just fell. Um, so I think the fact that I have to work hard to, uh, to do, you know, kind of keep myself as well, my head above water. I'm, I really am, I love to personally, I'm a very creative person. I love you know, making beautiful homes or rooms or things. And I think that's something that Ellen and I came together in a friendship over that. We both love to create spaces and I love doing that. I'm very passionate and care a lot about, you know, women, women's issues. Um, I really, that to me is so important, empowering women. Um, I always say before this, going into this, you know, I was in the world of as I go mascara to medicine and the power of um, mascara and really how when women look better and feel better about themselves, how that can be life changing. And I went to the jails for 20 years helping women. I was doing makeovers. And so I'm very passionate about that just messaging in any way uh, and supporting women. So, uh, you know, I love all the guys out there too, but I just, you know, I've always felt that. So, so from, from early on, um, that's something that I think people don't know quite how passionate I am about that. And for anybody who wants to listen, I did just finish, there's a, a podcast that came out. Uh, if you listen to podcasts, uh, Sophia Bush uh, did one with me, um, uh, with Victoria Jackson. And I think it was it came out a few weeks ago or a month ago and we could put that we can put that on the site and for those of you that want to listen it's sort of the story of me and you could put that on and maybe you'll fall asleep to it or um, <laughs> but it, it was it was kind of fun to do and went into uh to different aspects of my life oh that's very interesting i'm sure we we will love to listen to that yeah um can you tell us one of your favorite memories from any of the patient days? Oh my gosh. You know, to me, just they're all, they're all my favorite patient days. I mean, it's when I get to meet everybody, you know, it's like, uh, it, that's what is, you know, my heart of, you know, it's one thing when, as Ali said, and the two of us talked about early on, you know, it's not just about the two of us. It's when I get to just reconnect, whether it's with, you know, the young people, the parents, everybody. Um, it's, it's when I can continually put a face to, you know, this work and why it, what it means to me. And I know people know um, there was a moment when I had cancer myself and um, I was like, you know, just in my mind, I was like, no, nothing can happen to me. I was picturing all the faces, you know, uh, so of patient days. And that really pulled me through my own, uh, you know, challenging time of all of this. So that was, you know, just to be able to, um, 
connect. And I miss that. You know, that's why it was such a hard decision when they were saying, you know, we're not going to be able to, um, you know, have this because we, we didn't want to have people flying. And we were just at the beginning of all this really starting and all these lockdowns and things. And I was so sad because that's the time I get to see everyone and everyone gets to be with everybody and, and connect. So um, I, I love all of them. I just, I love the hugs. And that's like I was saying, I'm a hugger so that now we're gonna be in a different world of things, you know, but I will, I will miss that. Um, but we'll, yeah, I know we'll figure that, you know, that part out again, for sure. Of course we will somehow. Actually, there are lots of questions about that too. One says, how do you plan to evolve and hold conferences for patients considering the COVID-19 virus? Will there be an in-person patient day this year? That's what we're trying to figure out. I mean, we really are, um, you know, we started our last conference was at UCLA and it's a great venue. And um, I think that's going to be an ongoing discussion to see, you know, God forbid, is there going to be a second wave of this virus? Um, it's hard in terms of the planning to figure out what to do. So I think with the guidance of, you know, Michael, who's right there, um, Michael Yeaman, who's right there at UCLA uh, and on the front lines of everything. And oh my gosh, I know he's always quiet and everything, but he is such a, just, can I just say a hero uh, in, in the world of NMO, in the world of Victoria Jackson and Bill Guthy, uh, he is extraordinary because he, his heart is in this, you know, all day long. And oh, by the way, he might be working on like a vaccine or or some other life saving extraordinary thing. So um, I feel so grateful that he's been a part of this and that, and all of the people, honestly. So I will rely on all of them, Jacinta and Brian and team and everyone who pulls all the day to day and Dan and Megan and Renee, everybody who's there, have them guide on what feels like the best way to go. And then I really rely on, on all of you, the community to, you know, give feedback, give ideas, um, help inform and guide and share because we try, we're making decisions in real time. And, you know, so I, I don't mean to be vague about it, but it is vague based on, you know, what's happening and where people are traveling from. So I think we have to just stay tuned and see how we're going to do it. Yes. And I'm sure everyone will be excited to hear about the future plans when those come out and yes. we will definitely keep everyone updated about that. Yes. Um, would you consider hosting a patient day at a different location in the future? Several members have diet necessities and um, the Luskin Center has been unable to work with those patients. Yeah, we'll definitely, you know, we've tried to do different um, conferences and different, we've had different patient days that we've been a part of. We've been, you know, whether it's Ectrams and then there's been some more on a local level. So, you know, we'll, we will entertain all things and all ideas. So, you know, a lot of times you, you have to think about it. It's not always perfect uh, as we all know. And um, so, but we're always looking to see, you know, what, what, and that's why input's very important. So what can we adjust and, and figure out together as a group? Good. Um, Next question says, while I love to hear of patient days being held, there are never any close enough for me to travel to. Is there a possibility for more regional patient days in the future and more locations? Yeah, and I think that comes a lot of what needs to be organically happen is within the community itself. Um, those of you that are um, working with your doctor in a local hospital, you know, this is where, you know, we've had to, as I have, because of this, be really creative, reach out, um, do things that maybe you're not in your comfort zone, like find out about, you know, how many patients in your community have NMO, join forces with um, other people in the community and think about where you might uh, put one together and we sponsor it. So there's, a, there's so many different ways in which we can do this and we may all have to get very creative in doing that, but that's, that's you know, if anything, NMO does and foster and create besides all the bad things we know is it's going to have you have to think differently you have to 
sort of, you know, in real time, sort of galvanize all that uh, creative, okay, where can I go that I want to have this patient day? What can I make happen? Um, and, you know, that's something that Bill and I always have encouraged, um, even down to, you know, I think all of you know, we've not done fundraisers and things, but donating, helping out in any way is very meaningful to us. And 100% of that goes to research and moving things along. And I think it's what's uh, enabled us to obviously garner the attention of the pharmaceutical companies and have them be a part of, um, of this to you know really get us some real results. And that's, that's what I'm most excited about. And that's what I want to be able, the fact that we even have a potential therapy uh, and potentially we already have one and more to come, that's extraordinary in the world, in the real-time world of drug development um, in, in the world of disease and let alone rare disease. Very much so. I heard you mention fundraisers and also that 100% of all donations go towards research. Mm -hmm. Do you have a plan for any potential fundraisers in the future? We don't right now. Um, but that again, you know, right now we're sort of just reacting to what's in front of us, which has been, you know, everything shut down. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately we'll, we'll think about what that looks like, but I really have always encouraged it on a, on a grassroots level. Uh, and as again, I think because I, with doing what I have coming up with uh, the skincare launch for Ellen, that might help give me um, some creative ideas and ways in which we can um, also do some fundraising and, and do some messaging. But I, I just can't express enough that you all have to sort of really dig in and, and help on the whatever level you can grassroots, whether through your communities, other friends. I mean, when I started this 12 years ago, none of it existed. So the fact is that there is, there are, there are these resources out there and, you know, it's, there's a lot more than just, you know, there is the, we always talk about the power of one, but there's, there's a lot of people now. So the power of many voices is, is you know, can really continue to turn the tide and give you the support. Definitely, definitely support. Let's switch gears once again and go back to a fun question. Um, if you had one minute to choose your top four beauty or makeup essentials, what would they be and why? Oh my gosh, right now I just want hair color and my hair blow dry. Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, beauty essentials, I mean, for me, my whole philosophy, you know, my whole line and my business was built on no makeup makeup. That was my tagline. Um, so that's still it. So for me, it's, you know, a little bit of concealer here and there. And it depends, you know, I would answer that question differently uh, now with my at the age where I am now versus where I was then. But it was always still the same feeling with less is best, less is more. Um, no makeup makeup so i'd say for me it's always whatever concealer foundation and my hero product that really probably uh built the house of victoria jackson was my foundation which was like a no makeup makeup so uh and those of you trying to buy that i do not sell that anymore because i really did after ali's diagnosis i like literally closed the book on uh on makeup mascara as i said i'd written two beauty books and I just went life switch into this. And, um, you know, since wrote uh, two more books, which I've hoped that you, you've you all read, um, Saving Each Other and The Power of Rare with Michael. So um, yeah, so it's kind of whatever. I'm a less, I, I don't have a lot of patience for it. So um, in my last beauty book I wrote, it was like a called Make Up Your Life for those of you that can find it. it I did two minute, five minute, 10 minute makeovers and, uh, don't like to spend a whole lot of time on it, but it would probably be um, a good concealer slash foundation, an eyebrow pencil, a sheer lip, and uh, that's a, that's about it. Um, mascara, and we're done. <laughs> Great. Name someone that you admire and tell us why. Oh gosh, you know I never had any just one mentor, but I I'd say Gloria Steinem. Uh, 
is probably another one of my dearest friends, like how lucky am I? And I just admire her so much because she's been, you know, my, I guess if there's my uh, closest to a personal hero, she would be it. She is, um, you know, she's just still doing the work. She's 86. She's out there. She's for women. Uh, it's, it's just been, it's in her body. It's in her bones. It's, it's in her work. It's, um, and I just, you know, through this extraordinary journey, uh, I know a lot of you know, I was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, which by the way, they just started a book club and they picked uh, our book, The Power of Rare, a blueprint for medical revolution as their first book for the book club. So I'm really proud about that. Um, but going through that um, in, induction myself, um, I met these extraordinary women and they are all heroes to me. I mean, just incredible. So to be in that group and then that was in 2017. And then in 2018, I had the extraordinary honor of um, receiving the Pontifical uh, Advocacy Award from the Pope. Not too bad. All of you know, like I'm not, I don't like to fly. Uh, I was never a good flyer before all this, but I was like, nope, I'm going to Rome and going to be in Vatican City. And um, Dr. Yaman and I, Michael and I went as well with a group and it was extraordinary. So that was an amazing experience. Um, and then in 2019, I just had the privilege of inducting into the National Women's Hall of Fame myself, um, our Supreme Court Justice, uh, Sonia Sotomayor. And that was incredible. So to, you know, as somebody who, as I said, I've always struggled with my own sort of stuff and low self-esteem. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually inducting our Supreme Court Justice, one of them, into the National Women's Hall of Fame. And I think you could see that on their, their website. That was extraordinary, along with a lot of uh, amazing women that were there. Um, and then I had the extraordinary privilege um, our Justice uh, Sotomayor uh, invited uh, me and the family to come to the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court was before now they're they're all on the, the phone. Um, but I went to uh, Washington DC and was able to uh, sit in her box and listen to an extraordinary um, arguments going on at the Supreme Court and that was amazing. And so all of that has let you know come out of, you know, um, talking about like you don't know what's going to come out of something. Uh, if somebody would have told me that that would have happened as a result of my daughter having this and, uh, you know, I would have not believed anything that has happened uh, over the course of my life in this period of time it is totally unpredictable and extraordinary and been grateful for for all of those opportunities because they've all allowed me to continue on the work but with more people uh, taking a look. That's incredible. And I appreciate you sharing that. It's so many times we get so bogged down in our world of disease or NMO. And it's refreshing to hear you say uh, and talk about the opportunities that you've been given and that you've had and taken advantage of uh, in order to further the foundation and further your cause. And that's very appreciative, not only to me, but to the whole entire NMO community. Um, yeah. We thank you for that. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the foundation um, a little bit. Um, what are you most proud of concerning the foundation? Just, I mean, to be able to think that there's four, that there's been four international clinical trials um, is extraordinary. And that's been a result of what I've been most proud about is really the collaborations. The, the ability for people, which is so rare in medicine and science and research, is that for people to come together. I mean, that I, I think that's why everybody loves patient days, conferences, because you see it in real time. You see 32 countries that have shown up and they're all saying, hey, let's, how can we work this out? And, you know, we're doing this and what are you doing? And how can we share information? And I think uh, looking back at it, I would have to say it's the collaborations, the having to, when people go, why do you think you've had success? And I think about um, having to get to people's brain trust through their humanity and their hearts. And that has been um, 
to see that play out has been amazing because uh, you really feel that in people that they they got into this for a reason they want to help and um, sure it's been a lot of money spent and all of that and you know big pharma can get a bad rap and this company can get a bad rap but if you sort of can um, kind of work through all of that all the noise and get down to what matters which is saving lives and improving the quality of lives uh, that's that's been um, amazing to be part of that process and then to even think that that could turn the tide of thinking in other diseases uh, it's not something that I had ever thought about or knew about um, or was an expertise of mine and still isn't but um, that to be able to think that you you can have that sort of fingerprint of a on a blueprint even it, um, that that's an amazing thing to to watch and I had no idea how it would take on a life that it has. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you've talked about the positive and what you're most proud of. Could you talk about something in the foundation that you think maybe could be done better or is there a past example of, of failure from the foundation that you've learned from? Yeah, I think, um, I think, well, you always, as soon as you think you can't do something better, you probably should stop doing what you're doing. Um, so, because I think you can always do something better. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, in the beginning, could we have done conferences better? I, I'm sure all those things have evolved and had to get better over time. Um, you know, I, it's, I think that probably, you know, when something being with something's not working, um, whether it's in research or things, maybe making decisions where you're ending something sooner than later. But I don't know, you know, it's almost like not to say we haven't done everything right because we haven't, but it all sort of, you know, I, I'm a believer that it's all happened for a reason to get you where you are. Like you sort of you need to do things wrong like you really can't succeed until you've failed right and I really believe that so um until you've failed you can't succeed so all the things that you've done that maybe weren't perfect just are all part of ultimately I think your success so I, I think you have to so I don't know that I can look at any one thing um I'm sure there's just been little things um but ultimately I think it's it's gone way beyond what I even thought it would in terms of getting the pharmaceutical companies on board in a way where they're actually, um, we have potential therapies that are coming out. That may not be perfect. You know, there, a lot of the trials, I know people have come to me and said, you know, I don't like that I have to make this decision or that, or I don't know what to do. And um, they're tough decisions. There's no guarantees. Um, we made early decisions with Allie's care that I was, boy, I, is this the right decision? Um, is she going to have reactions? Is it going to go badly? Uh, all of what you deal with when these attacks that she just had, you know, what, you know, which were bad attacks or, you know, what are we looking at? Is she going to walk? You know, they're, they're, you're, you're dealing in some really tough spaces and, and small spaces and scary spaces. So you have to um, just keep moving forward and you're going to make mistakes along the way, but I ultimately think they were probably all the right decisions. That's just my belief. Well, I'm certainly proud of the foundation from afar, from watching it from the very first patient day with those maybe 30 people or so in the room to what it's grown to now um, it has been quite incredible to see. So I personally thank you for all you've done uh, for the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Have you ever considered, and this kind of touches back on your question earlier, but have you ever considered expanding the foundation or starting another foundation to help other rare diseases? Um, Michael and I have been approached to do that. And I thought, um, you know, I haven't, we're not finished with our work here. So, but other people have come to us, whether in the world of autoimmune disease in general. Um, again, that's really why that was the whole motivation for me in writing this book was to be able to sort of put that out there. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's part of me that has been really working hard on this for a long time. So uh, I have to think about what that next place is, whether, but I think that some way 
uh, the work is out there and it will continue to carry on and shine a light um, on other diseases that may live in the shadows and some that don't. Uh, so I think that we will continue to do that and that will evolve and, um, but yeah, I think that will, we're certainly passionate about helping. That's exciting. It's exciting for a lot of rare diseases and can certainly make a difference. Yeah. What are your goals for the foundation now and have they changed from the beginning? You know, as we always say from the beginning, you know, it's about a cure. Um, you know, I think if we're looking at potential therapies that come out where you have, you know, 89, 90% uh, efficacy in terms of stopping relapses, that's pretty awesome. Um, and of course, you have to see what are the, the upsides, downsides, continue the trials and see. Um, so I think that's going to be very important that we will continue doing that. And then Michael talks a lot about tolerization and I'll let him speak to that and see what the potential new frontier is. Um, we'll, you know, at some point we'll set up, I know he's been doing COVID calls, but we'll set something up where he can talk about some of the new therapies that we're hoping we'll have announcements for in the, in the next few months. So, and then maybe that next uh, frontier. Great. You've done so much for our community, um, comes from a patient. Um, and she says she'd like to thank you. I know there are several patients who want to advance their careers as a source of personal fulfillment, income, and then also one day contribute back to the foundation. What advice do you have for us on following your passion? And as a follow-up, does the foundation have any plans to support patients who hope to be entrepreneurs? Um, well, we're hoping that we are supporting you because we're giving you as best as I certainly can um, a quality of life that hopefully will allow for that for you to to support yourselves at, in your in your life goals um, because if we can help give you uh, good health then isn't that for all of us the biggest gift that we can give anybody so um, I like to think that we're doing that and and, and really mean that sincerely um, so you know however I can do it in terms of real-time encouragement and you know by example um, you know, everybody's roadmap is going to be different and you just have to be whether I've written books where I talk about, you know, and I think again on this podcast, there's a lot I talk about and just in terms of philanthropy and being in entrepreneurship. Um, it's just whether there's, you you know, the fake it till you make it or act as if or, you know, create a visualization and, and seeing where you want to be and then just kind of heading there and knowing that life happens. And then, you know, I, um, I speak uh, frequently at different uh, universities and I've spoken um, at UCLA or USC on it to uh, entrepreneurs, male and female, and just people, then, you know, you have to just be willing to, it's kind of what, who are you and what do you do um, when things happen in life? Like, I don't need to be telling all of you that are you know, been dealt the, the NMO card. So, um, but it's what you do. It's how you handle it. It's how you move through that. It's how you move forward through that. And, um, and that's everybody's path is so different, but it's the people that say, okay, I'm up for it. I'm, a, I'm on the ride that put themselves in the uncomfortable positions and take the risks and, you know, get really out of that comfort zone. And, even when you know things hit the fan and things don't go well, you still um, you still just keep trying to find that what's your north star. It's it's what I tell my kids, and you know they've got to figure it out for themselves. And I know all of you that are parents on the phone know the more you try to tell them, they're gonna they they need to do do it the way they need to do it. So I just encourage people to do it. Like get up, do it. You know, don't let this pandemic don't let NMO, don't let any of this define you and box you in where you don't make that move, whatever that looks like for you. Great. Many patients have written in wanting to know what is something they can do to help support the foundation and further the calls for a cure for NMO right now during this pandemic. I think, um, really like um, just putting it out there so people know about 
your story. They know about the foundation. Um, donations are great. Listen, you know, um, I've always said, you know, we've had uh, deep pockets, but not bottomless pockets. And we're very strategic now in what we invest in or don't, uh, just because we have to be like all of us, um, but also have tried to really be smart about uh, things that we're investing in, you know, that are more translational, that we can get pharmaceutical companies to be our support and help along the way too. But we are very grateful for donations. We're grateful for um, that, you know, positive look for the foundation. And if there's something that we're not doing right, or you're feeling, you know, you've got a suggestion, I'm more of a person, I'm probably not somebody who deals with like just all the complaints without the, okay, give me the complaint, but then give me what you'd like to see. Um, I work really well with that um, because I'm like problem and then solve it. So um, very much we're here. We're an interactive, dynamic, living, breathing foundation that is evolving and evolving with the times and want to hear everyone's voices and donations, support, all of that is happily um, received. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one last question. Um, I'm going to pose this question to you, but then I also want you to think about any closing comments that you may want to share with us that you feel is important. Okay. How close do you think we are to a, cool, to a cure? Well, man, when you start thinking about, and again, I'm reading it and now I'll, you know, we'll, I'll be living it in terms of some of these therapies coming out. If we're like truly 89 to 90% um, relapse free and we get into the world of tolerization and things that, you know, really you wanna, you know, now with once people have NMO, you're already sort of reacting to what's happening versus being able to even stop some of these things, which Michael talks about, um, you know, immune health and, you know, balance and finding out how do we not even, you know, because, you know, we don't all know why, why did Allie get NMO? Why did you get NMO? You know, why has this happened? Um, really trying to understand it, but prevent as best we can some of these things from even helping. So I think those things will ultimately are curative if you can stop it from happening in the first place. Like how awesome is that, right? Um, and then this new, I'd say some of these new fields that are emerging, certainly the time now we're in and where we are in medical research. And I think we're gonna see it play out in terms of even this because of COVID-19, we can all sort of sit back and especially all of you as part of the foundation and of you know, been part of patient days and, you know, Michael and I are always saying everyone is so knowledgeable, uh, all of you, when you're showing up and you're asking these great questions, uh, you'll be able to see in real time in the world now how all these countries come together or don't or pharmaceutical companies, how they work together or do or don't. And you'll understand the language they're speaking a lot better. You'll understand it. Um, I think those things are all going to be informative and guiding toward these new, you know, where are we going to be ultimately with cures with everything? So I hope we're close. I'm not stopping till we are. Um, and I just want you to know in terms of, um, you know, really in closing, my heart is in the same place. Um, my head is full with a lot more knowledge um, and sort of, um, I always think about when I'm making decisions and I've said this before, when I have to make a foundation decision, whether it's a funding decision or whatever that might be, I think of patient day, I think of all the faces, I think of all the doctors, the researchers, the scientists, I think of uh, Malud, who's been our, who's our global ambassador, who has been to, you know, all the countries in Africa, who's been to Russia, who's been to Rome, you know, all the different places um, and the work and the people that he has seen, that I have seen, and um, and try to be so thoughtful about, you know, there's times where I might be in a negotiation and I really feel angry or frustrated, but I really try to just think through what what is the, what would this group want me to do? What am I doing to, to get us where we wanna go? And I just promise that continued commitment and, um, 
you know, I really do miss everybody. I'm looking at a computer screen. I wish I was looking at all of your faces, as I said in the beginning. And I'm just a very, very, you know, I get choked up because I'm, I'm just a very grateful and very, um, very fortunate. So I, I wish good health for everybody and um, that, you know, everybody comes out of this okay and know that the foundation is still standing. We'll all be standing and uh, we are stronger than ever. And I appreciate everybody taking the time to tune in today. Thank you so much, Victoria, for being with us today and speaking from your heart. I know the patient community really enjoyed this and um, I look forward to our future online breakout sessions. Thank you everyone who joined us today. And again, very special thanks to you, Victoria. Thank you. Bye.